specifically be talking about new understandings of space and then non-representational methods. Um, yeah, uh, so 20 minutes max, leaving plenty of time for discussion afterwards. I just share my screen. Okay, yeah, so what did I, what did I talk about last week? Um, I started off by just introducing non-representational theory because, you know, the audience, you know, you're mostly sociologists, you might not be so familiar with non-representational theory, certainly not as familiar as geographers generally are. And so I was just talking about what it is, you know, as a, as a, as an approach. And, uh, yeah, I, I, one of the things I said that was that non-representational theory is based on observation that the vast majority of life, in fact, the world, exists outside the realm of representation, that is instead non-representation. And by that, what I meant was that it lies beyond text, beyond narrative, uh, beyond even imagery, uh, beyond full mental cognition. It's immediate, it's physical, it's material, that's what life is. So in, in response to that observation, um, I mentioned how non-representational theory aims to show or animate the world. It's taking place, uh, if you want to connect with sort of that geographical concept of place. And to animate the, the raw spatial practices and performances and expressions and communications undertaken by not only humans, but by non-humans as well. Um, so that's, yeah, that was my sort of introduction to non-representation theory uh, and what it was all about. I, I went on to talk about how as an approach, it, it's, it's, um, was based on a, on a critique of human geography in particular after the cultural turn. And I talked about how it's based on an observation that much contemporary human geography after the cultural turn, in fact, most social science after the cultural turn, had become obsessed with representation, with squeezing the meanings out of text and narrative things people write and things people say in order to uncover hidden discourse, ideology and social structures, the digging down and digging down over time. And I mentioned that, you know, in terms of practice, all too often, social scientists, we, we report on quite specific things that happen to our subjects. But then we almost immediately start to theorize and to interpret we attempt to peel off the layers of what they said and what they wrote in order to find mechanisms, consequences, and meanings. And this kind of process it reconfirms our existing conclusions of the world. And a lot of research on the culture turn, you can almost, you know, just read the introduction or read the, you know, start the abstract, and you could, you kind of know what the uh, author, what conclusions the authors are going to draw at the end of it. Um, so yeah, that's non-representational theory uh, is a is based on that critique and it's a reaction if you like to to mainstream uh, social science and art culture so it's coming up to the next slide um i then talked about the theoretical foundations of non-representation theory and i mentioned that Non-representational theory isn't one theory, it just, it, it's not meant to be read as singular, but more as plural. It, it really uh, involves a number of contact zones with a range of established theoretical positions. Um, these uh, contact zones include, uh, include things like material cultural studies, performance studies, ecological anthropology, sensory sociology. Um, there are even contacts with neurosciences and theoretical physics. 
And in terms of philosophical traditions, contact circles include with social ecology, speculative realism, neo-materialism, and active network theory. It's a whole range of theory brought together. And non-representational theory is unashamedly selective. You know, it takes bits and ideas from each of those traditions that it see, that it that it can, that it can be seen as useful. Um, you can really critique that, so it's a bit loose or a bit convenient, uh, but that's nevertheless what it's tend to do. It's a magpie theory. I then last week went on to talk about the sort of the new world out there that non representational theory seeks, seeks to engage. You know, it's not just motivated by, you know, critique of the cultural turn, critique of existing social science approaches. It's motivated by a new emerging world and the need to, 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 to develop a research approach that reflects it. And I talked specifically about the forms of the new capitalism that emerged in the last 20 years um, and how non representation theory uh, seeks to tackle those forms head on. I talked about turbo capitalism and fast capitalism, uh, Marx acceleration and modes of accumulation, exchange, destruction, and change that have occurred in, in recent years. I talked about the idea of effective capitalism, emotional capitalism, and the way that uh, capitalism trades in immediate sensory and emotional experience using sophisticated techniques that draws people in, creating uh, synthetic atmospheres to engage them. Um, I, I talked about uh, uh, cognitive capitalism or surveillance capitalism, the idea that through technology, capitalism knows consumers like never before. Uh, it collects vast amounts of information on our behaviors and our desires. Um, and undertakes almost zero time synthesis and uh, rapidly reacted to the information that it, that it gathers. And so, yeah, non representation theory, in many respects, are kind of a, a response to try and sort of make some sense of that and account for that in social science. I then went on to talk about some of the facets. On the substantial focuses of the non representational theory, you know, if you could boil it down to what is its main interests, or what are its main interests, they include things like practice and performance, uh, the unscripted, coincidental, accidental, unique uh, that occur in life. Um, I talked about transpersonal sensations and atmospheres, um, particularly. Uh, uh, the interest in non representational theory in affect, uh, it being a spatial concept in itself. Um, and I talked about the focus on ordinary and everyday, in that non representational theory is not focused on the elite, special, specialized, but on the everyday things and the everyday spaces of life. These Things are not those neutral backgrounds, but important because they constitute the feel of the majority of our lives. And collectively, they constitute the rhythms of the world we live in. I then went on to talk about how non representational theory has helped us rethink space. And I talked about the idea, the, the Understanding of space, which is moved on from. Uh, I talked about uh, Newtonian idea of absolute space, the Cartesian uh, idea of geometrical space, the Marxist idea of the production of space through labor relations. Um, I talked about phenomenological understandings of space, which would be something much humanistic and social, constructivist geography and sociology over the last few decades. And I talked about some. Emerging space and structuralist ideas in space. And yeah, I talked about how non representational theories retain certain understandings, but largely moved on from those, those predominant understandings. That's where I got when it all cut off. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and we went about our days. Uh, so yeah, um, 
I'll just pick up. I'll pick up there then, and yeah, I want to just do two things for the main uh, sort of fifteen minutes, and that's talk about the new new understandings of space that have emerged in non-representation theory, and then uh, secondly, think about some methods that have been developed uh, by non-representational theorists and human geographers to try and uh, to try and uh, collect all of this kind of information and try to sort of uh, um, understand and analyze space uh, in empirical studies. So, what are what new understandings of space uh, have emerged? Well, I think there are four or five. Um, the first is that in terms of its existence, space is not something that occurs on its own. It's not, it's not just something that's out there. It's not an entity unto itself. It's entirely dependent on objects. Space is an emergent effect of the relationality. It only comes into being through relationships between objects of positionality, causality, and change. Without objects, there is no space. The second understanding that has emerged um, is it connects to kinetics. So in terms of kinetics, because all objects from those extensive and complex to those minute and simple are in continual motion in the world, everything moves to some degree. Because of that, the object relations that create space are in constant flux. Space is constantly moving. Ultimately, space is constituted by a network of relational material flows. And itself as a whole flows. The third understanding is about production. In terms of production, because in any region of space, objects rise and cease, objects move into it and out of it. And ultimately, because they form impermanent assemblages of particular particular character, space is ontologic, is in a never-ending process of being remade. Constantly remakes itself. The fourth idea is it, 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 uh, connects to the idea of space's productive capacities. In this constant remaking of space that I've just outlined, there exist all possibilities and actualities for the world's trajectories, all objects, systems, and outcomes that make the world in all its diversity emerge as dynamic temporary unities within space. Space is the basis for, the for all productions in the world. And finally, there's some ideas about thresholds and vitality. So on one level, space is more than some of, some of its parts in terms of its qualities, productive capacities, in terms of how we experience it. On another level, counter to the general trend of increasing disorder in the universe, certain regions of space and social space tend to move themselves, at least initially, to forms of greater order and complexity. On both of these levels, I think it's true that space is excessive in that it evades formal measurements and quantification. It's vital and it's excessive, but it's hard to pin down and quantify. So there's some ideas of space that have emerged through non representation theory um, and underpin a lot of research. We're not always re rehash or, or, or you know, rewritten in every empirical study, but it's 
it's in the theory of eight, because it's in the world of scholars like Nigel Thrift. Um, and it's, it's a, it, yes, it's a movement and a development from earlier understandings, for sure. But also, it is what has proceeded from this thinking of space that has led much contemporary non representational theory a quite specific empirical knowledge base and a, and a, and a certain familiarity with notoriety. And that is the attention that scholars have paid in their empirical research to the vital textures in the movement of space as it unfolds as the progressing moment. So, the world, if you look at the literature, the most widely discussed of these material textures of space have been its flows, its rhythms, and its momentums that enroll and carry life forward. Secondly, the positions, spacings, shapes, and foregrounds and backgrounds and lines of action that lend space its basic form and expression. Thirdly, the, the imminencies, the events, and the encounters of space that create points of change in the world. Fourthly, the sensuous properties of space that make it recognizable and fit to entities registering it. And finally, the habitual or machinic and often synchronized forms of repetition in space that give space a certain character and a certain predictability. So moving on, uh, and this is the sort of final uh, topic, uh, I want to say a little bit about methodological styles and requirements in non-representation theory. And I will state that no methodological manual exists for non-representation theory. Right? There's not, uh, there, there are not, not many uh, 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 texts out there and papers out there which outline the methods one could use if you want to dip into non-representation theory. Um, but there is a general understanding that as a non-representational theorist, you need to be prepared to experiment with methods uh, to produce case-specific hybrid approaches um, with, the, with the objective that your research doesn't stray too far down the route of interpretation and explanation. So method in non-representational theory is sort of led by the sentiment, let's try it rather than let's judge it. Um, and importantly, I think it aims to do two things, and I'll talk about these in turn. Firstly, to witness the world, and secondly, to act into the world. So in terms of approaches, um, uh, 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 witnessing really um, requires want to undertake highly sensory orientated methodologies, such as sensory ethnography. Methodologies and approaches that tend to the body's register, but also to the lively, fleeting, and more than human in life. One approach is to overlay specific methods and techniques. For example, in a lot of studies, we see that um, Authors combine things like photography and film and other visual approaches with traditional field notes to help them record and show a situation in more than one way and provide different registers and angles. Witnessing is also uh, ass uh, assisted or aided in the way that studies are written up. Um, and if one reads non representation of work, it often uh, uses a very lively academic writing style, a style that attempts to escape the sort of stilted categorical academic frames that academics often use, uh, and, and, and to try to avoid that kind of exclusionary academic language that they use. So, not unlike the language used in the performing arts. Non-representational theorists tend to uh, try to incorporate an irrealist mood in their writing, a mood that actively embraces movement and expression, a mood in their writing that is restless, 
that is tantalizing, that has a kind of living quality in itself, that attempts to uh, form itself in the image of the thing that it's trying to represent. I suppose trying to simplify that using a sports analogy, non-representational theory, writing in non-representational theory is more like play-by-play -play commentary as, the, as opposed to post-game analysis. As Phil Vanini, who has a methodology in, in non-representational theory, as, as, as he notes, while most tr much traditional ethnography in the way that it's written points to what is the case, Ethnography informed by non representational theory is far more impressionistic. It doesn't try to be precise, definitive, or reliable, or even neutral. It kind of flirts with reality. It unashamedly tries to fail and try again, and fail and try again, making sense of things over and over. Moving on, thinking about acting into. There's definitely a political uh, motivation and element to non-representation theory. Acting into indicates a close relationship between the researcher and what is happening in the field. And a muddying of roles of the academic and subject. Certainly more so in, tr in traditional bodies of research. And indeed, with non-representational theory, method is itself a performance that does not only study social life through the acquirement of data but also through joining a social reality someone lives the data so continuing developments in methodological hybridity just noted interviews and focus groups for example can be more about the interpersonal re interactions themselves during the event than the actual story is told. And participant observation can be somewhat reversed to become observant participation. And this involves the researcher doing the same thing as the participant, but getting actually more involved and entangled in the action than what would usually do as a researcher, to get more invested in the effort and experience and actually at times even actively intervening to change events and create new ones. As Phil Vanini notes then, not only is method in non-representational theory focused on effect, it is self, it is itself effective. Now there are significant challenges with doing this type of research for sure. I mean just one one thing sort of engaging with effect, for example. Our effect is something that's, as, as, as I outlined last week, and as many of you know, that is physical, less than can be consciously experienced. A lot of non representational theorists use our effect as a concept in their studies. But the trouble is, as a researcher, you know, you're in the field, you want to write about effect. As soon as you start participating, as soon as you start to think of yourself as a researcher, you try to record things, you step out of that effect. You're out of it, you move yourself out of it. So you can only really look retrospectively at it. You, you, know, you, you can't really capture it in the moment. It's always afterwards. And you know, that's, a, that's a challenge. I think also a problem has been in terms of method is that it's just the title of representational theory. Uh, it's not very accurate. Um, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to be a researcher and to do not and to not represent, right? Just by very definition, as a researcher, when you're in the field, you end up representing. Even if you use these methods that I that described, you know, previously, you're still ultimately going to represent something. Um, and this is has sort of led certain scholars, uh, notably Hayden Lorimer at Glasgow, to suggest that maybe we shouldn't continue using the term non-representational theory because we just can't do it in the field. Perhaps a term like more than representational would be more appropriate. Um, when you're attempting to animate the active world, but at the same time you are representing, you're doing more than representing.
so a few final thoughts. You know, I haven't mentioned much in the way of critique uh, when it comes to non representation theory. And I suppose if you've been listening to the last hour, hour and a half, you'd assume that everybody loves non representational theory and human geography, and it's just great. You know, it, it, it definitely has its detractors, it definitely has its opponents, and there are critiques of it. Some people in human geography have written uh, limits. It, it really is a bit of a social physics, right? It, it's, 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 a, it, it's sort of almost a return to science uh, in this tries to map out positions and movements and things like that. And in doing that, lacks a sensitivity and compassion. So I would take issue with that, but nevertheless, that's a pity. Others have written and uh, suggested that it's overly masculinist. Uh, that it's a quite masculinist male way of doing research, right? Um, they note as well that most non representational theorists tend to be men <laughs> from certain UK institutions. Another critique that's been conveyed is that <clears throat> even though non representational theory claims to sort of move away from text and narrative to, to, to animate the, the, the active world, despite that claim, it's still very texty. You know, what have I been doing for the last you know, hour? Uh, uh, I've been talking about theory, trying to describe it in, in, in words and text. So despite its claim, it's still very texty. And others have, 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 have critiqued it for its endless relationality. You know, it's, it's where's the solid ground? Where's the centered ground? In, 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 in non representational theory, everything's relational in space. You know, what have we got to hang on to? And that includes methods, that includes theory as well. If you're picking, you know, this one, this philosophical tradition, and this one, and this one, you know, where is the centre ground? Will the centre ground hold? But I, I, I'm sort of going to finish, I'm going to close with, a, with, with some thoughts uh, that were initially uh, uh, conveyed by. Um, uh, Coles, Rachel Coles in, in, in Durham University. And she suggests if you want to dip your toe into non representational theory, you don't have to go all in, right? You can use the principles of non representational theory to augment your own research, to give it a new angle. And so she suggests, as a researcher, if you want to get into non representational theory, what you need to do is develop a nomadic consciousness within your research study. And, and she needs a nomadic consciousness, consciousness between focusing on the representation of what we usually do, and also at the same time focusing on the non representation. For example, she says uh, feminist scholars might acknowledge in studies that gender differences in terms of sexuality and age and things like that are not only about identity and conscious comparison but also simultaneously about lived aesthetics and material and affective forces. So she suggests, yes, that's one way of entering the world of non-representational theory, helping it you know, provide new ways that you can provide new insights into your research, is to develop a nomadic consciousness. I think that's a good way to start, it's certainly the way that I started, and I continue to try and do that. So there we are. <laughs> 